Hello, my name is Emma Reid and I'm the Global Marketing Manager for Cisco Networking Academy. I would like to welcome you to our final event in our current Women Rock IT series. Today, our guest speakers will share their career journey and how they have turned their passion for the Internet of Things technology into rewarding and successful careers. I would like to welcome our live audience of over 7,000 people joining us today from all around the world. Welcome. By being part of our live audience today, you can access our free online courses offered by Cisco Networking Academy. The introduction to IoT, networking essentials, introduction to cybersecurity, essentials in Python, Linux, and entrepreneurship. These courses are a great way to add more skills to your resume. Details on how to enroll have been placed in the chat window, or you can scan the QR code you can see on the screen for details. Please hold your questions for our guest speakers until the end of the session. If you have a question for our guest speakers today, please post it in the chat window or tweet your questions to hashtag WomenRockIT. Thanks, and let's get started. I'd like to introduce our guest speakers, Flavia Tatia Nadini, who is a trained rocket scientist and space industry star who has won in dailies and first among equals 40 Under 40 Awards. Flavia graduated in aerospace before becoming a space engineer. Her first startup was a space engineer, uh, education company sorry, called Launchbox, who taught school students how to build 3D nano satellites. And she's now the founder, co-founder and chief executive of Fleece Space Technologies. We will also hear from Susie George, a co-founder who built the next generation of umpiring assistant technology in cricket. Susie brings her broad range of skills and capabilities to deliver faster umpiring decisions with greater certainty using innovative sensor-based sports technology. But first, we'll hear from Flavia, who is joining us from her offices at Fleece Space Technologies in Adelaide, Australia. Welcome, Flavia, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Emma, for the introduction and welcome everyone from uh, for the start chat. We are very excited. I'm talking to you from beautiful South Australia, Adelaide, very lucky state, you know, in this point in time. I'm in my office, so I'm not quarantining. So a really strong thoughts for everyone that is following us from lockdown situations. So I'm going to um, talk to you a little bit about myself and my journey as an entrepreneur in uh, space tech. Um, next slide. So um, let's go back a little bit many years ago, not so many. I am just 37 right now, but you know, I was a little lady once, a little girl. I'm Italian, so I was born in Italy and uh, I am part of a very big family of five in which almost all of them are engineers or very low with engineering capabilities. I was low with space. Um, it's hard to tell you why this happened. I really, since I was a little girl, was very passionate about space activities. I was passionate about uh, stars and building rockets. Um, sometimes I just think that that was the destiny of my of my entire life. I do. Uh, I did study though. It was not just simply dreaming. And I I became um, an aerospace engineer. So I started my bachelor and a master engineer in space. Uh, I really fell in love with um, rockets as all the women do, and I really started studying them properly and uh, found a job in the European Space Agency. That's kind of the NASA in Europe, uh, working in all sorts of things from uh, components for rockets to another topic that was very small satellites. So when I graduated, um, small satellites were starting to become an interesting topic in the space industry. These very small satellites are, you know, as you will see in my presentation is coming, are really changing the way space is handled. And they are as big as a shoe box. I was very fascinated by this change in space tech, and I focused my attention to work on them. So what's happening in space? Um, I, I summarized the space activity really talking about a couple of um, 
billionaire that made their money in the software industry that decided to jump in the space industry because they probably thought we got this. And they actually do because they are doing amazing things. So we watch what Elon Musk and Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos are doing, have been doing in the past 20 years is really changing who and what profile of people can work in space. Um, space is usually always being dedicated to uh, just really able to be paid by government. But now people are launching more, lock, more rocket than ever before. Of course, everyone knows about SpaceX and what they're doing. And I'm pretty sure that each of you at the beginning of the week saw Richard Branson going to space for the first time. So there is a change in space technologies and companies are raising VC money. Um, the, the change is driven by... Uh, kind of miniaturization of components that happen in the same in the in the computer industry, for example. Now it's happening in space. So we were used to have these massive satellites as big as a bus. Then suddenly computers are becoming smaller and smaller and we can launch satellites as big as a shoebox. So you got this massive phenomena of small satellites. You got this massive phenomenon, more rockets. So now imagine you can do go to space constantly, a lower cost, having an Uber that brings you to space all the time. What can you do? What can you do when you have space, access to space? What can you do on Earth? One thing that we decided to do is tackle the Internet of Things um, market. I started six years ago. I founded Fleet and raised a lot of VC money, but I was fascinated by IoT. That um, it, it, and you will hear, and the, in the, in the person is going to talk after me, Susie, that she used Internet of Things for sports. You know, I was fascinated about the Internet of Things for industries. Now the Internet of Things, so every single device that is not a computer, a phone, or you know, um, anything related to human, there are more IoT devices than computers. So it is fascinating. And one big problem is that ninety percent of the surface has got no connectivity. Something that we don't think because, you know, we got our 4G and 5G and it's all beautiful, but 90% of Earth, human and spaces included, they don't have connectivity. That's the type of problem I wanted to solve, you know, give connectivity to entire Earth, particularly because Internet of Things is reaching everywhere. You know, it's self-driving car driving in the middle of nowhere. It is a lot of industry that are in the middle of nowhere. So that's the type of problem I wanted to solve. Um, next slide. Um, clearly, there is another massive trend that I am particularly fascinated about that is all the renewables and how much they're transforming energy. So um, I don't know if any of you is interested in what's happening with energy and with the, literally the fifth industrial revolution. It is, I am a big um, fighter against climate change and I made sure that my startup follows this purpose and this this guide. Um, I've been watching with interest what's been happening in the past three years with grids and energy and storage and grids that you know you can sell the energy into the grid and gigantic hydroelectric power lines and solar farms. It's so beautiful. And I really hope the earth is going in this direction because we have a responsibility to take care of it. But it's a really tricky topic because we actually um, count on critical infrastructure from pipes and, and digs and, and poles and wires that are actually really old. So we are putting a lot of pressure for renewable in a system that is already struggling. And, and this is why we see fire, fire, wildfires in California uh, due to, you know, power lines. And even in Australia, our biggest um, hydroelectric uses a battery. So it really pushes the boundaries. So critical infrastructure are usually very unconnected. And it's very difficult to digitalize them and control them. Um, so I was very passionate about this topic as well. Um, next slide. So what we really decided to do is build a satellite system, lower cost, that was just dedicated to this industrial IoT change. So dedicated to protect and monitor um, energy distribution uh, assets and resources. So I, you know, when I saw the fifth industrial revolution was happening, I wanted to be part of it. When I see that most of the companies around the world are trying to digital assets, uh, digitalize many type of assets to make sure that we protect Earth, that we implement renewables. I wanted to provide connectivity that is important for them to leverage. And we have done that in a pretty complex technologies, you know, very, very advanced technologies. Next slide. 
So uh, the, the, the trend of industrial IoT is a bit different from consumer IoT. So in consumer IoT, you go city, so yourself with Alexa and Google Home and all sorts of things that happen on city level. On the satellite level, you have to think that what we're interested about is industrial IoT. And industrial IoT, they've got really critical um, requirements. Bear in mind that industrial, in, the, in no industrial IoT, people still put human in cars, you know, when there is a blackout in pulse and wires in energy, people in cars go and try to look where the pole is down. So our entire society and the most important thing to us that are energy, gas and water, they sit on very little visibility. So all this critical infrastructure, they are moving into providing an IoT solution to have visibility and leveraging new protocols. There is no Wi-Fi, there is not Bluetooth. They're inventing new protocols. In the past 10 years, um, a lot of players around the world have been building new uh, and, and designing new protocols like LoRaWAN, MBIoT, long-range protocols. So we are in the middle of a time that is very similar to the time when GSM was built. You know, there, there was a word protocol at the time, and GSM became the protocol for all the phones, and the protocol that we use around the world. We are in another similar time in history where um, they're building new amazing protocols and for everyone new that listens. This is a very interesting topic for, for IoT in general, not just for industrial IoT. Because, you know, when I started six years ago, ago, there was a massive hype on IoT, but now it's happening. And LoRaWAN and NB-IoT, there are hundreds of hundreds of millions of devices out there that have been connected and trillion. So it's important to understand that this is something that's going to change the world. And it's very complex. It's not easy. Internet of Things is complex. Uh, sometimes I feel like the very beginning of the internet in which you, people had a computer and everyone loved it, but looked at it and say, what am I going to do with that? Ah, you know, I saw an um, uh, interview to Bill Gates and someone asked him, but what is the internet? And he was like, you know, it's a place where you can have all the information. And the other person was asking, Okay, but what about books? So, you know, there is this point in times when people invent things and no one understands. In the Internet of Things is very similar. But there are technology that enable Internet of Things, and we are very interested in, uh, in all this connectivity side of the story. Uh, next slide. Uh, I, I believe, you know, the connect, well, connectivity is there. You, you can make it up. And this is, I want to uh, push everyone to think that this is a massive market. So we got, uh, because, you know, it is for each of you that are listening to us, is the, is the world that we're going to live in the next 20 years. So you've got space industry that is booming. We got the SpaceX of the world, the, the Virgin, and the, the Jeff Bezos of the world uh, trying to you know to reach Moon and Mars and doing amazing things and enabling the low Earth orbit. This is how we call it around Earth to deploy satellites to, to save Earth, to help Earth, you know, to have a different vision on Earth to provide connectivity and photos and data. On the other hand, you've got Internet of Things that you know per se need that connectivity. So we are talking about a massive market, and we are in the middle of this revolution. So we need to make sure that we understand what this is and we contribute to this change. Next slide. So um, we use three technologies, so uh, we, we call it massive IoT, so gigantic uh, arrays of devices that can gather data for everything, that collect data and send it to this constellation of small satellites in what is called low Earth orbit. The satellites are very small, they fly like a flock of bees, you know, you've got hundreds of them going around the world, touching, touching with connectivity. The, all the different sides of the world. So you are literally building the digital nervous system of Earth from space. Um, next slide. Um, what is interesting about the technology, because you have to bear in mind that by building smaller satellites, you enable a lower cost to deploy infrastructure in space, and you actually allow people to connect devices at lower cost, because satellites is very expensive. Like to, to send some SMS and some basic data via space, you could spend thousands of dollars. So how do you enable this proliferation of devices with very, very small satellites? That was my personal entrepreneurship journey that was very, very hard. So, you know, and we have big nerds and I love it. So when we started, we decided to take this interesting 
communication system that is inside the F-35 and putting into a small satellite that is this size and create something that's called beam forming. So beam forming are the technologies that are really improving 5G and they are really kind of changing the way communication is done. So we are in the in a moment in the verge of a of a new way of providing connectivity but i've got a video um, that i would like to show you to explain to you what space iot and beam forming is all about so if you can play the video you will see space is no longer the sole domain of government and multi-billion dollar satellite space is open for business and we are only just starting to tap into what is possible. Our industry-leading innovations take the best of tech and adapt it for the challenges and opportunities in our growing fleet of nanosatellites. Our brilliant team's work on integrating beam forming is just one example we are excited to share. With a crowded radio spectrum containing all the world's wireless communications, bandwidth efficiency is everything. Radio signals can be mechanically steered through the shape and direction of an antenna. Beamforming allows an array of antennas to digitally steer the signal by manipulating the phase and amplitude. The steerable pattern combines to boost or nullify the signal in certain directions. With beamforming, we increase the throughput of customer data service a higher number of portals at once, and increase data reliability and security by reducing the impact of interference. But while beamforming on Earth is quite straightforward, trying to manage this in the vacuum of space on a tiny nanosat, not as easy. We have very, very tight constraints, limited power, battery size. We reroute the signal processing algorithm to reduce its computational power, and we manage the battery depth of discharge when beamforming to extend its life. Radiation in space can corrupt data, and temperature swings affect synchronization. We run simultaneous code that verifies system integrity, and also an internal calibration process, which corrects synchronization errors across temperature gradients. A small volume to fit everything in. We 3D print our optimizer Antenari and iteratively design our circuit boards to be able to fit it inside the nanosatellites. Radiating access heat away. We thermally isolate the beamform payload and we use custom thermal straps to conduct heat away to the exterior walls. And with everything close together, there is interference to protect from. We do a lot of testing and redesign, testing and redesign, and more testing. Nanosats already dramatically reduce the cost barrier for getting into space, and by integrating beamforming with the unique methods we've developed, we can do more work, transfer more data, and do it in flexible, secure ways never before possible at the scale. The promise of satellites servicing the Internet of Things is not about smart refrigerators, but about collecting and organizing vast amounts of data from every remote corner of the Earth. From tracking power outages, renewable energy, and bushfire risk, to applications in defense, mining, and logistics, everything hinges on how efficient and reliable the satellite system is. The future of space is open to disruption at every scale, and discovering new ways we can innovate in space is what drives us to do what we do every day. So we built some breakthrough technology because the reality is that when you want to do things and, ch and change the world and do it such a large scale, it's not just a piece of cake. You need to build something different that no one has ever built. So we built this amazing digital beamforming system in the satellite. And we built this gateway on the ground that allows every single IoT devices to backhaul through satellites. And this the build of these two R&D projects, a lot of work and a, and a lot of brains of software engineers and, uh, and electronic engineers and embedded engineers. It was just a, a really a group of very smart people trying to push the boundaries of what is possible. Um, next slide. Um, we have so far launched six satellites. So our fleet, we uh, get, um, we we started in Australia. I moved from Europe. When I came to Australia, Australia didn't have a space agency yet. Um, I moved here eight years ago. Fleet is six years old, and uh, it was it, just the idea of building a space startup out of Silicon Valley was pretty. Um, 
uh, out there six years ago. A lot of people told me, hey, if you have to build a space startup, you should go to the Valley. And I think space is up there. So no matter where you work from, and, you know, I built a family in Adelaide. I was here. So I just wanted to demonstrate to all the people that told me this will never happen that I was really able to do it. So we raised money with the biggest VC in the country. And with that money, there was a little titanium amount of money. We launched four satellites in one year, demonstrated what we wanted to do, kept going. This year we have launched other two and one is on its way. So we have launched six satellites. And the goal of our constellation is to launch 140 more. And these satellites have been building, has been launched with SpaceX, that of course all of you know, but also, you know, uh, the ASRO, so the Indian rocket, and one of the rockets that I really adore, that is Rocket Lab uh, in New Zealand. So this is a startup built by a Kiwi in New Zealand. That race is now a unicorn. Uh, so you can see in the Asia Pacific market how incredible the drive for space tech is at this point in time. Next slide. Um, this is the satellite, and the satellite it is, it seems big, but it's really tiny. It's, it sits on a table. So you see that it's got, you know, a stack of uh, central computers that enable the satellites to go around Earth and navigate around Earth. So every minute, the satellites see every single part of Earth. It takes him 90 minutes to do an orbit around around our planet. It's got, of course, solar panels, and they've got a lot of amazing technology. It's a tiny space. It's a tiny space to find the terabytes of data. So a lot of interesting engineer needs to work on it. Next slide. So at this point in time, we build our satellites. Uh, it's a kind of a complex supply chain. We build them in California, assemble them in Italy, do parts here in Adelaide. Um, what we really wanted to do is reach a baseline. Because what is interesting things about this new space economy, that when you reach a baseline, that means a satellite that you trust. Then you can start mass manufacturing them. So you mass manufacture satellites. There are four teams in the world that mass manufacture satellites. You can count them on one hand. And now fleet, uh, particularly with the launches of the latest two satellites, Centauri 3 and Centauri 4, we reach a baseline. And we absolutely adore these satellites. They work very, very well. So we are starting mass manufacturing in this year. So moving to a much bigger facility where we can literally manufacture them as you do with a computer and a laptop and launching them anytime soon. So next slide. Uh, why do we use the satellites? You know, I think more or less you've understood this all about IoT, but we are changing the way industries manage their data. If you look at this industry, hydroelectric, water, rail, power, mineral exploration and gas operations, Listen, none of them, they barely use satellites. The, all of these operators, they've got thousands, if not millions of assets in the middle of nowhere. Most of the adulating companies are in the mountains, you know, where there is no connectivity. So water, again, water, gas and energy, that the basic of our survival on this world, are basing on infrastructure that are in the middle of nowhere. So we are so used to, to have connectivity. Imagine how they operate, you know, without having connectivity. So we started providing services because of the cost is down, because of the system is dedicated to this type of asset. We started sharing this type of connectivity solution to customers that never get connected before. My opinion and my vision about, about digitalization is that once you provide connectivity, then you give a tool to these operators to understand more. And, and the impact on Earth is, is, is very profound. You can start saving water, you can start saving energy, you can start you know, making sure that your impact on the environment is not so profound. You don't know what you don't know if you don't connect. So most of our customers are in these sectors and we really support them given connectivity in remote areas. Next slide. I want to give you some examples to, uh, to understand a little bit deeper how space tech can really change life on Earth. I, you know, there's always that naivety of like a space tech girl entering and try to find solution for the energy market. I never realized that in every country in the world, poles and wires, so like every state, you know, Australia has got 750,000 poles, but it's not like this in the US, it's in India, it's everywhere. All these massive infrastructure are not connected. There is 
not data coming from them. So if there is an outage or something and a pole goes down during a storm and, you know, the entire city is without electricity, the poor operators don't even know where it is. So, you know, this is why we wait for the power to come back for two hours. Because when you got so much assets, can you really deploy GSM towers everywhere? You can't. Can you really spend $1,000 for poles? You can't. So that's it. This is what we have been doing for 50 years. But and now just talking to space at very low cost, you can actually track everything. So it is so rewarding to enter in a life of customers where for 50 years have been so digitally absent to finally have the ability to, oh, this is my network. This is how it operates. What can I do to make it better? So this is big, big part of the world on Pulse and Wise that now is connected via space. Next slide. And uh, another big example is, is pipes all over the world. You know, uh, this is an example for gas pipelines in which, you know, urbanization, for me, this one, the gas pipeline that can heat and they got massive impact on the environment. Hydrogen is coming into the picture. So hydrogen is now put into gas pipelines. And, you know, if you, if you believe it or not, that all the gas pipelines in the world are monitored by people going up and down with a car on thousands of miles and kilometers of pipes everywhere in the world. People are in the car all day long, go up and down a pipe, or take an helicopter going up and down a pipe, because there was never a solution to connect these things. Now we use machine learning cameras to understand if someone digs around that area and, you know, he can blow himself out or can create an incredible energy impact by having gas leaks. So it is beautiful to support this industry as well. And another example, an industry that we are supporting is, uh, for an, in the next slide, um, it is, uh, it is water, water in general for, you know, I, I, I'm really interestingly watching the mining industry and the way they've been operating for many, many years, particularly now that there is this desperate request for more copper, more lithium to support the EV uh, world, how mining are pushing themselves. And if you, I didn't know, but then I realized how much water is used for mining activities and how much, in, you know, how much complicated the operations are and very unconnected and very in the middle of nowhere. And they need to go and drill to find things. We don't want them to drill where they don't have to drill. So what can space help with this? So we actually really support this industry to try to make it more sustainable and try to protect earth in the way they operate. And less than not least in the next slide is the hydro world that I'm a big fan of because I believe that we are moving into a phase to use the power of nature to allow us, you know, to, to um, have energy and, and all this type of infrastructure against us. But uh, hydro always incredibly shocked me for the complicated environment, the lack of connectivity and people having to walk up and down a pipe between a pen and a paper writing if there's a leakage. We are in 2021 and our critical infrastructure and critical industry supports our lifestyle. They struggle because connectivity is not present. So these are the type of problem that I'm trying to solve. And if you see in the next slide, the, the idea is, um, is to build 140 satellites. So this year we actually uh, move into mass productions. We are building our um, manufacturing park in which we will be able to build 50 satellites a year and, and launching them. And they are small, so they don't create massive space debris. They are very regulated. Uh, they usually last three years, and then they come back into the atmosphere and they burn. So, you know, they don't create space debris because space debris are other things that I'm very, very protective of. But, you know, try to build this amazing capacity, okay, in the sky. It's a pretty regulated business, but Philly did really well, and we got now uh, ability to operate in every side of the world. So... That's what's going to happen. We started with a little dream six years ago, and in two, three years' time, we will have this amazing system around the world that will support all the critical infrastructure and the critical um, main basic needs of humankind to make sure that we keep growing as a population without having to destroy Earth in the meanwhile. So next slide, I guess it is the end. So I really thank everyone, each of you, to listen to my story. And please don't be afraid to contact me if you need anything from me. I mean, I'm a busy girl, but I am a big supporter of everyone that wants to do tech and change the world. Busy? Okay. No, really. I mean, 
Wow. When someone says, uh, so Flavia, what did you do today? Do you go, mm, yeah, started a space agency and uh, just launched a couple of rockets? Um, That's what I do. And, I, and you know, sometimes my kids, I've got to lead the girls. They're like, mom, have you been in space yet? And I'm like, no. And they're like, you're going too slow. And I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, so they're pretty bossy little ones. Uh, so that was one of the questions. Have you been to space? So you've already answered it. <laughs> I listen, believe it or not, about going to space was one of my dream. And uh, uh, last month, the European Space Agency put a vac put a you know, 20 vacancy out for astronaut astronauts. And uh, and this didn't has it happened for like 20 years. And of course, I got a European passport. So I went and saw the criteria and realized that I meet most of them together with 20,000 people. But I thought, how amazing is that at least I meet the criteria. So I applied, you know, and I went to my 80 or so. And I listed, there has been 20,000 applications. But the simple fact, the honor of having applied, I think was great for me. And she was like, yeah, yeah, you need to follow your dreams, mom, go and conquer. So uh, again, there's been 20,000 submissions. So I'm not going to probably go to space. But I saw this morning that Richard Branson is putting two free tickets to go to to space with uh, him. You know, I'm trying to reach luck, you know, so I'm going to apply with those as well. Eventually something will happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like winning the lottery, but if anyone deserves to go, I think it should be you. Oh, that's good. Good vibes and energy for the universe towards me. That's nice. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. We're gonna try we're gonna hold questions for you now, Flavia. We're going to actually go across now to our second speaker, um, Susie George, who's the co-founder at MyCore by Sports Tech Industries. Susie also joins us from her home in Adelaide. Welcome, Susie, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Emma. It's a real pleasure to be here. And Flavio, that was just amazing and inspirational um, to, and, and really just out of this world. So um, thank you, everyone, for having me today. And first, I wanted to start by sharing a little bit about my story and my journey. I grew up as the oldest of seven children. I grew up in Adelaide in Australia um, and really with very little money and resources and also wasn't able to access formal education until I started in year eight, which is the first year of high school um, here in Australia. So as I was getting ready to speak to you today, I was really reflecting on opportunities that I believe to be available to me growing up in that environment. And I just had very little context for possibilities, especially as a female. And what I hope to do for you today is to provide some context for um, opportunities perhaps either in sport or in technology broadly and ways that you can access them. And I was thinking about the courses that Cisco are offering um, today that I know Emma's mentioned. And one of the things I really love about them is that they are free. And for people who, there's just still so many people who grow up and live in poverty and with very little access to resources. Having programs like this be free um, creates opportunities that don't discriminate. And I just, I really love that. So um, I think they're wonderful opportunities for everyone to get involved in and find out ways that you can further your opportunities within technology. Um, for someone like me growing up, having access to it for free would have been absolutely crucial. Um, there just wasn't much to go around and, and certainly not for further education like that. Next slide, please. So looking forward from my childhood, I began formalised education in year eight, and it was actually at school that I eventually met my husband and who's now also my co-founder, um, Peter George, who's there um, in the picture. I came from this context where I just had very little, very little background or context for opportunities. Um, and Pete, even as a teenager, was a really big dreamer. He had this big, huge dream that he wanted to play cricket for Australia and he was just so certain that he would achieve it. And I was really just hooked. I was hooked to the dreams. And our life together officially began in 2007. So we've now had two children, founded Sport Tech Industries together. And Pete did eventually play cricket for Australia as part of a 14-year um, professional cricket career. My career really has been around um, it's primarily in law and I did a business and marketing degree and it was this commercial education and experience alongside Pete's cricket career that have really provided the backbone of the success that we've achieved so far with Sport Tech Industries. Um, although we're both from non-technical backgrounds, 
I think we're really just starting to understand as, as a society that for careers of the future, it's just absolutely essential that you understand technology and beginning to understand how technologies, um, you know, what Flavia just explained and what are, are going to be disrupted by technologies of the future. And every time there's there's changes to technology that grows and evolves and our vision has to grow and evolve alongside of it. Um, so now I'll talk to you a bit about sport tech industries. Um, I'm going to use the news story today to that we used to launch our company and raise our first capital. It's a really great overview of our business and the vision and the problem that we set out to solve. Roll video, please. Meet Michael, the device set to rid cricket of this. With, of course, Ishan Sharma and the no balls, 22 uncalled. The brainchild of pace bowler Peter George, he played a test against India, but the light bulb moment came when watching one three years later in Adelaide. Ryan Harris taking the last wicket to Australia go 2 0 up, and then hold on, no, we have to wait, check the no ball. And it just killed the entire moment for me. Studying engineering, frustration turned to fascination. He built a prototype. The sensor on the shoe calibrates with sensors in the ground, outlining the crease. It registers impact, and if it's outside the electronic field... Michael will call the no ball for the umpires. They will receive the signal as it happens. That happens by a small handheld device the size of a mobile, replacing the umpire's current clicker counting balls. The beauty of it is they can focus at the other end and hopefully make better decisions at that end as well. Forget the DRS, Hotspot and Snicko, my call has the potential to be the most relied upon technology in world cricket. It doesn't need TV cameras, meaning it can be used from internationals down to grade cricket. You've got to feel for the umpires. It's such a hard thing to watch that front line and then move their focus down to the other end with the batsman. And forget the size, most of the bulk is batteries. A flat, bendy lithium one will fix that, but requires more funding. Once that happens... We can be having a, a training within the next year, and then in games, hopefully the following season. Ben Davis, 7 News. Give you a really good overview of the talk, and I'll introduce you to my husband and co-founder a little bit more. Um, since filming this video, we've achieved a number of key milestones, including funding, um, marketing, and awareness, and some key hires. Next slide, please. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the development process um, and how we went through from that original prototype, how we've used each iteration of the product to raise more funding and how we've built our business alongside of it. So this is the photo of the original prototype that was in um, the video and it's it's just very basic, but this allowed us to raise our first capital. The battery was bulky, the electronics didn't have the needed precision um, and we really needed to do upgrades like what it mentioned in the video so that it could be sturdy and would stay attached during play. So in a cricket environment, there's quite a bit of strain that goes through the bowler's feet as well as them sliding around in the field. And so that was a lot of the requirements that we had from a usability point of view. So next slide, please. This led to us upgrading the electronics and new casing. So there's some photos of here. And we were able to use these to do user testing and field trials. What we're looking at is, is it going to stay attached what about when they slide in the field and also particularly around the batteries? And I saw quite a bit of um, was mentioned in Flavia's work about the batteries too. And we also had some fairly complex requirements. You're looking at trying to create a device that can sit on the back of a bowler's shoe and be small and be transportable and be light, but yet last for an entire day of cricket, five or six hours. So there's a lot of looking at how do we get that battery life to last, but also battery size to be small. You know, can it turn off and turn on and can it be, um, how does it then trigger to turn on? Also, the, the complexity that you've got a number of different players wearing it and you've got to know which particular player is, is the relevant sense, that has, is wearing the relevant sense of the one who's bowling. And there was quite a bit of work there um, around that, but importantly, this updated uh, version was enough to help us to raise um, more funding. And particularly at this point, we started to be able to attract some government funds. And that was a really key milestone for us 
to be able to um, match government funding alongside of our capital so that we weren't raising as much equity funding. There's a number of programs in Australia that will match 50-50, um, and, and so your capital goes twice as far. Next slide, please. Um, part of the complexity, I think, with entrepreneurship, and I'm sure Flavia would speak to this too, is that alongside of building a technology, you're also trying to build a business. Um, and a brand. And so these images look vastly different than the first ones. And the reason for that um, is that we were able to invest into professional branding and design for the first time. And this was really exciting for us, but it was also just a really huge learning for me um, about how all the different facets come together to make really great technology. So the previous versions were designed predominantly by engineers with a real focus on the engineering technical capacity and the research and development. Can we get the, the signal to work? Can we get the accuracy and reliability? But not a lot of focus on the design and user experience. Um, so with this version, we spent quite a lot of time with the industrial designers and we were really looking at how do we not only create a product that works, but also creates a really great user experience. Um, and where you've got products that are being used and touched and felt by consumers, that is as important and it's part of the technology experience. And so that was just a really key learning um, for me and a really exciting part of, of the journey is to see it go from the sort of um, electronics just with basic casing to something that and I think that's my marketing um, background and really something that you want to touch and feel and put in the hands of consumers and get them to use it. Next slide please. As we went through all of these development stages we were continually talking to um, key governing bodies and, and cricketers and getting it used and, and having these conversations um, and continually working with the tech. There was a lot of R&D involved um, and then we just kept hitting a lot of the same issues. So we're experiencing issues with signal strength. We're experiencing issues with battery life. And as those issues were continuing, our development timeframes were remaining uncertain and our path to market was, was uncertain as well. And I think there's some complexity in a path to market with cricket because it's all based around tournaments, which only happen once a year in each key country. Um, so if you miss a milestone, you really are pushed back um, and, and you, you know, you have to wait for the next big opportunity. We also were getting some regular market feedback from various parts of the cricketing, cricketing community that there was hesitation about having devices on the field and on the pitch. Um, we also had some investors express concerns about whether the technology would be adaptable to other applications and other sports. So we kept running into a number of different issues in a few different areas and none of them were insurmountable but I think it was enough to make us stop and sit back and reassess really where we were going and what we were doing. So the first thing that we did as part of that assessment process and learning was to bring in a technical consultant to relook at our options. We'd worked with a lot of um, external providers but we hadn't had our own in-house um, technical expert. We had relied on the technical ability that Pete had and working with suppliers. So we brought in a consultant to really look at what do we have, what are our options and what can we use. Um, and then we went back to the sort of the things that we had learned about the sport industry. Next slide, please. And some of those were about the challenges that are unique when putting a technology into sport. So it's a very complex environment in terms of, as so I'm particularly talking about an in-game environment. There are players, they're, you know, that just, just from the, the player's point of view, they're running around, they're sliding on the field. Some of them have, um, you know, pants and clothing that might obscure lines of sight. Um, and then into the broader sort of system, you've got up to 60, 70,000 fans in a, in a venue, at least you used to, maybe not so much right now with COVID. And they've all got um, phones with connectivity. And you've got broadcasters, you've got other types of technology. There's um, real estate like the stumps that is already being completely used by other technologies. And then you've got all of the different various stakeholders that operate within that that game system. So it's a really quite a complex environment to be implementing a new technology into. 
And then you've got high accuracy requirements, particularly at the elite level. Um, you have really high requirements in terms of the accuracy and the reliability, and this comes alongside with scrutiny from media and public. If the um, technology gets it wrong, the, the cameras, uh, get the, the TV cameras, they're there and they're going to pick it up and they're going to know, and um, that's not going to bode well for your technology. And then you have a number of game security and game integrity issues. There's issues within sport globally around match fixing and bet fixing, and there's a lot of requirements that have to be um, operated within to ensure that the integrity of the game is protected. So there's really some unique challenges that we learned um, are there and have to be overcome in terms of implementing a sport within, sorry, implementing technology within sport. Next slide, please. But there was also a number of opportunities and particularly focusing on cricket, the opportunities that we had identified were around training, especially injury management. There's some existing technology providers who are working in this space um, using GPS tracking. One of them is a company called Catapult. Then it's fan engagement and, and, and providing new types of data and new ways of entertaining fans. There's a couple of uh, companies who are developing smart balls and smart bats, and then there's some a technology which is also Adelaide-based called Zing Stumps, which has bales that light up, which a um, number of you who may be cricket fans or watchers may have actually seen because they're implemented in most T20 games around the world now. And they they create, they change, they've changed the way that we that we watch and that we actually engage with sport either in-game or via broadcasters. And then there's also decision-making technology including Hawkeye and the goal line technology. If you just flick to the next slide, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, particularly in the shifts that we've seen. So these are some of the technologies and a timeline of what's been implemented um, within cricket and a, and a brief look at tennis and soccer. And when I analysed the trends of what's been introduced of over two decades now of, of technology being introduced into sport, what I saw is over here on the older technologies, you've got technologies that create a signal and then they require some form of manual interpretation by a human. And it provides for better decision making than has been allowed for in the past, but it creates delays in the game. And that's problematic for a number of reasons. It's problematic for fans and it's also creating a number of um, problems for broadcasters. So the transition that we're actually seeing towards these more modern technologies are technologies that create instant signals and create the potential for instant decision making. And I think that's actually where we're seeing technology and new technologies be coming in, that they have to focus on creating a better fan experience, not just better decisions, but a better fan experience with that instantaneous um, decision making so we put all of that together and we we and the and the and the new direction and what we made the decision was for next slide please was that our focus and our focus moving forward will be looking at artificial intelligence and machine learning technology we're really going to be focusing on that in game environment to start with with looking at the no ball rule that was in the video as the first step of that and we are currently reviewing supply models for how, what that, how that supply will be um, arranged. And I can't say a whole lot publicly yet in terms of the future direction, uh, but we're hoping to be making some more public announcements over the next uh, few months. What I'm really excited about is the adaptability of this technology that way exceeds what we had previously. And it's going to create opportunities to shape the way that sport is played, trained and watched down the road and around the globe. Next slide, please. When I really reflect on what we've done so far, where we've come from, what comes up time and time again for me is that where we've succeeded has actually not been where we've listened necessarily to all the way that everybody else does things, but it's where we've stepped outside of that and looked at what do we do that's different and what do I do that's different to what others do around me. And I think this is really the diversity and inclusion message. Um, and that is where we've been successful. I look at the first round of capital, which we raised in four weeks, and no one knew that that was possible. Um, and we leveraged the connections that we had. We leveraged, leveraged the story that we had. 
And we did something that was different. There's so many great resources and education and mentoring and programming, and that forms a really fantastic you know, knowledge foundation. Um, but don't divorce it from the, the things that make you special and the things that make you unique. And so really I want the question that you ask yourself today is how can I stand out, not how can I be the same as everybody else? Next slide, please. So thanks again. It was a really pleasure to be here and to share my story with you all. And I really look forward to hearing your questions and answering them. If you would like to connect with me, you can connect via LinkedIn and that QR code will take you straight to my profile. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Susie, um, for sharing your journey with us and your innovative technology. It's just amazing. Um, you really don't understand how much you have to think about. And, you know, when you started talking about the security and preventing tampering of units, that, that's the start of my head started to spin a little bit there. Um, there's a lot going on. Okay, we're going to take questions now from the live audience. Um, we're getting a huge amount coming in. So I'm going to start with one that I think is top of mind for a lot of our audiences um, with Flavia. And that is, um, how do you see that fleet could actually help with climate change or work with energy companies to improve their environmental impact? So if you look at the example that I gave, you know, things that I've seen in the past three years supporting these companies, uh, they go to, from different topics. So if you go into the hydroelectric company, something that I didn't know, like, because the infrastructure and the pipes and the dams are actually quite old, um, they need to monitor them. But sometimes it happens that there is a leakage and water gashes for weeks. Okay, so you just can imagine how much water gets lost. Um, it is normal because it's a very complex environment, uh, but it really fascinated me that technology can actually prevent. I mean, when you think about drinkable water, we are talking about such a small fraction of the water available in the in the world. Like, And if you think about that small fraction, how much is used for us and how much is used for agriculture. So less than the past couple of years, we have done this amazing work in uh, South Australia with SA Water in which we equipped every oval and every park of the city with uh, IoT deployment. So IoT devices, so they were tracking the soil, the weather, and all the condition of everything, and realized that, as you probably know, that most of, of us uh, irrigate in wrong ways or waste a lot of water. So I was fascinated about the waste of water that is from your backyard to operations uh, like a hydro company and it's just due to the lack of insight so water is one of my top thing you know how do we preserve water um the other things is of course is energy you know so if you look at the big change in energy uh, they are all related on the consumer base they are all related to solar panels and power walls okay so how do you move energy into a town into a city you need to enable um energies uh, kind of these grids okay so that everyone can uh, can can use solar as energy and solar can be profitable for you, for everyone to deploy it can be put into the grid. So there is a, an infrastructure exercise and, and, and solar needs to be tracked and solar farms are in the middle of nowhere. And most of the time to increase their efficiency, you need connectivity. You know, so if you look at every single renewable entity, okay, it is very, it is, it is, um, they have a massive impact. So, I mean, I, I'm going to be a little bit more pushy on these answers as well, in a sense. Like, in the past three years, a fleet, it was a startup. We need a revenue. I have no work with coal. Like, you know, like if a company comes and gives you five million to work with a coal, but, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You know, because if you have, if you want to have an impact, a large scale, you can make decisions. And I can promise all of you that this year, uh, so I've been raising three rounds of funding. And this year, so the last one was two years ago. I'm raising now. So I went back to talk with investors around the world. And the language just changed. 
you know, two years ago it was all about oil and coal and, you know, efficiency and that. Now it's all about energy, energy, renewable energy, you know. So there is, uh, this is because I'm a pretty positive person, there is an impact that technologies can help a large scale. So my idea about helping is if I can give connectivity for people to save water, and energy and avoid major industri- major environmental disaster by giving them an insight on things, that's where I want to go. Okay, so that's what I want to do. So my, my theory about climate change is that it's so hard for everyone to understand because we cannot measure. You don't measure things enough. And the reason why we don't measure them enough is because they are very large scale. They are large scale problems. There is a consum- consum- you know, the, the, what is in the atmosphere and what is in the oceans and how much things we waste. There are, the earth is so big. But if you can create a space system that enables that connectivity to happen, the measure to happen, there are no doubts anymore about the fact that we need to make it happen and we all have to work together. So that's my two cents. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I think the measurement piece is is key, but it's also an incredibly complex and big question um, to answer as well. So thanks for tackling that one. Um, I do want to just uh, bring you to the comment that some, Sarah of our live audience today, Flavia, she did mention that she was listening to Kim Ellis Haynes this morning, and she said it. Uh, she said to be the first female Australian astronaut. So. A little bit of uh, more competition for you out there. I love it. <laughs> okay, we're going to jump over to you now, Susie. We've got a question from our live audience. If you get government funding, does this mean that you get to hold on to your equity position better than if you get equity funding from non-government investors? Absolutely. So the funding that I received was 50% matched. So if you raise $500,000 of investor capital, then you also get $500,000 of government money. So it effectively halves the amount of capital that you have to raise. It allows you to raise more equity. Sorry, hold on to more equity. Hold on to more. Yeah, yeah. And so while we're sort of talking to you about that, um, you mentioned working with a variety of stakeholders. How do you work with um, uh, boards of cricket, as an example, to enforce the use of new technologies? Um, and how do you get across the, right, the line that you are disrupting the game of cricket? Is there a lot of pushback on that? It's a really complex problem. Again, you're looking at governing bodies across the globe, but with such different stakeholders, and it really comes um, down creating a stakeholder management plan and executing. In terms of the pushback, we have to tell me how I can get on board and how I can support it. Another one is, sounds good in theory, show me when it's done. And the other response we get is, it won't work. And I've learned that they just fit in the three buckets. So you've just got to leverage the the ones that are really supportive and getting on board with you and, and, and really try and, I think, um, uh, silence, I guess, for want of a better word, and uh, the the or neutralize the ones who are who are non supportive. And I think, as Fabio was talking about, as you go on, you start to build um, reliability and and trust and all of those. And I think those that third bucket will become less and less as you prove that it's true. Yeah, managing your stakeholders that's really important, and so is trust. So fantastic. We could. We could do whole webinars on, on that. <laughs> Haven't got time today, but I might take you up on that later. <laughs> um, so back to you, Flavia. Um, you mentioned that IoT isn't easy and it's really complex. How did you get going about explaining this simply when you started out trying to get your venture capital funding? Um, it's been a journey, okay, because when you actually want to, want to try to build something that no one knows much about, you know, when I started, it was this, at the same time everyone else was starting to understand it, like Cisco itself, you know, even big organizations. So I realized that the only way to understand, to explain new technologies is building applications. So instead of saying, okay, you know, yeah, we're going to connect all the things, uh, you know, it's going to be amazing, it's going to be an in- similar to the, the question for Bill Gates, what's the internet? Internet is that thing. So if you actually explain, hey, with internet, you can send emails. And why do I have to send emails? Oh, you have to send emails because when you're at work and you want to contact someone, it will be really good to have an instant communication. So 
There is a, the way to explain it is applications. So this is what I've learned. You know, like it's it's what look at what um, uh, for example Susie is doing. If we suggest pitching. Yeah, I'm going to put devices in every single spot person in the world. And that's it. That's my pitch. That is pretty cool. But no one will understand it. But when you give you an example, uh, you see the device on the shoe and what could be the impact. There are other million applications that Susie will build with that technology. But she has to start somewhere to, to explain what it is and what could be the impact. So the biggest lesson that I've learned about explaining to VCs and explaining to the world about new technology is doing them actually make them happen, make something happen. Because if you were small, I love the video, Susie, with the little PCBs attached on that. You should see my first satellite. You know, that bunch of crazy <laughs> stuff assembled together. So once you've got that application, that experience, even if it's a bureau, even if it's like, it is it is what people get. Because not all people are visionary. Not, not all VCs are visionary. Not all finance people, not the public, don't get it. My family started getting what I do like one year ago. After four years, dinners and lunch, so what, what exactly do you use the satellite for? So it is a bit of a journey. And my lesson learned there was like, get into an example, get into the nitty gritty, make it happen. So people will start seeing the opportunities. Great response. Fantastic. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. We are getting huge amounts of comments of people saying how amazing you've both been today, how much they've learned. So thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your journey, Flavia and Susie, and for taking the time out of your busy schedule because I know how busy you both are. So again, we're closing out now. So all presentations and recordings will be made available on our Women Rock IT website after the event. We have posted the website link in the chat window. If you would like to pursue a career in IT just like our speakers today, take a look at our free Cisco Networking Academy courses. All of our courses are internationally recognised. Details on how to enrol have been posted in the chat window or you can scan the QR code, which is on the screen right now with Cisco TV, to enrol into a course. Next slide, please. To find an academy near you that offers more certification aligned courses, visit our Cisco Networking Academy locator. Details on how to locate an academy near you is posted in the chat window, or you can scan the QR code on screen to enrol in a course. Next slide, please. By being part of our live audience today, you can download our Women Rock IT STEM passport. You collect all five avatars by the 1st of August and you'll be entered to win a backstage pass with one of our Women Rock IT guest speakers. To download the passport, scan the QR code on the screen or use the link we have placed in the chat window. Next slide, please. And finally, your feedback is really important to us. Please complete and submit our survey and you'll receive a certificate of attendance. Again, thanks for attending today's event of Women Rock IT. Details of our new series launching very soon will be found by visiting our Women Rock IT website. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. My name is Casey Shemansky, and I am a content editor for our talent brand team. In 2004, uh, my younger sister Kelly passed away unexpectedly. Obviously, it was a very difficult time for me and my, and my family, but we came together. We realized we wanted to give back. I think what makes me want to take action is, is a big part of, of my upbringing. I think a lot of that comes from being a first responder family, and when others are running out to safety, my family was always running in. In 2011, St. Baldrick's found me. The St. Baldrick's Foundation started with a bunch of first responders and it kind of became a challenge between them and it was if you raise X amount, you'll shave your head and you'll go bald. And now they're the second largest private funder of children's cancer research in the United States. It pulls at your heartstrings and it gives us purpose. I would love Cisco employees to join me. I would love to have more bald heads on campus and, and on our WebEx calls.